Today we talk to Jörg Wittmann. Where are you from? I'm from Munich and I live in Munich and in Berlin. Why did you choose the clarinet? I started playing the clarinet at the age of seven um, because we, they played instruments to us in a kind of uh, pre-college uh, class and I said I want to learn the clarinet but as you know uh, children sometimes they they want a dog they want a cat the next week maybe an instrument so they asked me are you really sure and I said I'm very sure but then when they understood I really want to learn the clarinet they supported uh, me with the clarinet and since this I play the clarinet. What do you always keep in your clarinet case? Ideologically it's of course the music which you love most. So the music which you love most, uh, most of the pieces I play from memory, but if the clarinet itself is missing in my case then I'm in trouble. <laughs> How did you end up becoming a clarinetist, a composer and a conductor? So with me everything started with the clarinet itself and I improvised at home uh, a lot when I was practicing after, after I started playing the clarinet. Um, and then the next day I was very angry with myself because I could not remember anymore the beautiful moments of what I improvised the day before. So I had to find a way to start composing, which I did shortly afterwards. And even at the beginning of when I started co composing, I thought that's the definition of composition, which is writing down what you improvise. And of course it's more complex, but I still like this definition a lot. And only years after um, I started conducting, which was 11 years, more than 11 years ago, it was when Maris Janssons uh, conducted with uh, Bavarian Radio Orchestra. He had a Beethoven cycle and he asked me if I could write an overture to a program, Beethoven program, Beethoven 7 and 8. So I wrote the piece and I think I was in Hannover, but I had promised to give a clarinet class. And then it was already the second time. And shortly before it started, in the evening, I got a phone call from Maris Janssons and he said, uh, and I must admit, I was so late in delivering my piece. I was very late. So the last pages, the violins were on the top of the page and the flutes somewhere. So it was, was, was a little bit a mess. So Maris Janssons uh, called me and he said, you wrote a great piece for us but you have to conduct the first rehearsal. And I was shocked because until then I had never uh, conducted. Then I asked him, when is the first rehearsal? And he said, tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. I said, I, I, I have to give this clarinet master class. I cannot uh, come. And he said, please help me. I really need help. You have to do it. And otherwise we cannot do premier your piece. So unfortunately, I had to disappoint the, the clarinetists and we did it shortly afterwards. We did the clarinet masterclass, but I took the night train. I will never forget that. And I tried to write, organize my score. And I arrived in the next morning in Munich and I could not finish, you know, organizing my score yet. And with the orchestra, uh, Bayerische Rundfunk, I played many times. We had played uh, Mozart clarinet concerto many times. We premiered clarinet concertos by Wolfgang Riem, for example, already in 1999, together and so on. But you don't want to be in front of this orchestra when you had never conducted and you have to conduct. A complex piece, which I, I, I had written. So I did, and Marius Janssons was there. I was, for three minutes, I was pretty nervous, I must say. But then, after three minutes, I kind of enjoyed it. The orchestra enjoyed it. And it's still a legendary story amongst my colleagues from the orchestra. And, and Marius Janssons, afterwards, he encouraged me a lot to continue with it. And in the same year, in the Paris Opera, I did with the German artist Anselm Kiefer, figurative artist, painter. I did an opera 
for the last production of Gérard Mortier. And we, in this production, he also asked me if I could co uh, conduct it. And first also I said, well, let me write it first. I'm not sure if I can do it. But he encouraged me. And that was in 2009. And since that moment, uh, with a lot of joy, uh, I also conduct. What do you enjoy most, playing, composing or conducting? Everything. For me, everything is music. It's different forms of music. But in the end, it's music. Even under torture, I would not be able to decide. Music. Everything. What inspired you to compose your Fantasia for solo clarinet? Of course, I wanted for a long time, already at that time, I wanted to write something about our instrument, my instrument, the clarinet, which I love so much. So, um, but the reason, the outside reason for it was a similar reason why the Bartok contrasts middle movement, piano, was written. Because in the case of Bartok, the CBS, the record company, and you know the famous, you know, uh, cast of the premiere of that piece and premiere recording, Benny Goodman, Josef Sigiti, Bela Bartok himself at the piano, and they told Bartok, because we should not forget the Bartok contrast was first written, only first movement and last movement as a kind of rhapsody, and then they told Bartok. You know, there is still space on our record. Could you write us another movement? So that was the reason why the Bartok contrast was written. With me, it was my very first CD. I recorded with a wonderful uh, Russian pianist, Anna Gurad, who was a student colleague of mine in, in Munich. And we recorded our first CD and the record company, uh, they said, well, you also compose, right? write us a little clarinet piece. So that was the outside reason. And then I started writing it. And as you know, it's a love declaration to the clarinet. In six minutes, I put everything, not everything, but a lot of what I love in the clarinet into this music of the fantasy for clarinet solo. What are you trying to express with this piece? In this piece, uh, my idea was a very theatrical one. So the fact that the clarinet is an instrument which can produce only one sound at a time, I wanted to resist. You know, that's the reason why the whole piece already starts with a multiphonic, so four pitches at the same time, actually. And by the way, they are tonal. So there are many, you know, multiphonics in modern pieces. You know, it's almost a cliche in a certain period, you know, of modern music pieces. So, but I love multiphonics personally very much, but I wanted to use a tonal one. So that's why this uh, multiphonic, exactly this one returns each time. And also for the structure of the piece, I did not want to have one monologue of the of one clarinetist doing one atmosphere. I wanted to have almost sometimes like even a fight or a dialogue between different characters like in the Commedia dell'arte. That was my basic idea. That's why I also write in the foreword that I wish that you create as harsh and extreme contrasts as possible. That's the reason. What life-changing advice have you been given? From all my teachers at a certain point, some things which you don't forget, but in general, some advice from people who make something which seems to be difficult for you a lot of easier. These are advices are priceless, you know, it's, this is, you will not f forget them. For example, with uh, Pierre Boulez, I, I worked a lot, I played his Dialogue de l'Ombre Double uh, clarinet solo piece with electronic a lot, I worked with him, and you know, it's like a forest, woods of notes. It, it's so complex in terms of rhythm, in terms of dynamic, in terms of pitches, it's always there, you know, boom. It's, you know, tons of music, you know, you could, uh, your wallpaper on the wall, you could do a whole, uh, a, a whole room with it. So I worked with him the first time, so I asked him, so this number one, it's so difficult, and it hurts, by the way, in our arms. So I asked him, it's so complex, how can I do this, you know? 
Then first of all he said, well play the strophe and the refrain. I said, please, come on, where is the strophe? Where is the refrain? I felt really stupid in, in that moment because for me it was just an incredible amount of notes. So I said, look, here, that's the strophe, here's the refrain. And suddenly it became so easy. And also one and another thing which he told me was, you have to feel like a fish in water. Be totally relaxed, but you have to be able to change your, your direction very quickly. It sounds very simple when I tell you now, but like when you open a book, it was a revelation. Which concert will you never forget? Yeah, the first Freischütz by Weber, which I heard as a child. I will not forget this in my lifetime. Why? Because I got so scared in the Wolfschlucht scene, in the Wolfsglen, you know with the dark clarinets, these in thirds, this incredible music, which I st still love today and I consider this music modern music. It should also be played at modern music festivals. I'm very serious about it. it it's the most modern music you can imagine. These high piccolo flutes, I still hear them. And the, uh, the women's choir, ba da ya ba da -ya. And so on. And as a child, and my parents still uh, told me afterwards, they told me I was really scared. Because, you know, as a child, when the adults want to scare you for fun, you feel it, you know, you, you la even laugh with them or you do it for them, you know, for the joy of, of the adults. But when you are really scared, you feel it. But I was not only scared, I was fascinated and still Today, as we all clarinetists, of course, for good reasons, but also for the Freischütz, I love the music of Kamaria von Weber, and I think it's a ne neglected composer. It should be played much more. And I'm somebody, I just recorded a Weber, whole Weber CD, where I play concertino, a grand duo. I conduct the Freischütz overture and so on, a Weber clarinet quintet in the orchestra version. It's masterpieces, all of them, all of them. So this I will never forget. There were many other uh, concerts later, the Messian Opera, uh, Fran uh, Saint Francois d'Assis in Salzburg, which I heard, it changed my life. And it was a Boulez concert, which I attended as a boy with my father. We went to Strasbourg and the Dialogue de l'Ombre Double was played in this program. And I was like somebody uh, in his first pop concert or jazz concert. It was a completely different language and I was so inspired afterwards. But especially the Weber Freischütz, I will not forget in my lifetime. Can you share a funny anecdote with us? <laughs> Actually, there are many, but, but not are there really funny ones. I mean, there are some embarrassing ones for myself. You know, when you come on stage, with your colleagues and you see oh you forgot your music but that's not really that's not really funny as a child we did really stupid things on stage sometimes when with a colleague we played around with the music stand in japan and it was a ensemble of young musicians and we had so many concerts i think 10 concerts in 14 days and we were children it was with an ensemble of the munich philharmonic it was the children's concerts and that was one of my first pieces I also wrote. So everybody of us played one movement of a Mozart clarinet concerto, horn concerto, violin concerto. Um, and there was a string quintet of the Munich Philharmonic senior players, great players, and we were the young ones. So we played and my first piece was played in this program. And the last concerts was for the sponsors, you know, for the people who gave the money for the tour. But as a child, you don't care, you know, it was the last concert. We played 10 concerts, which is a lot, you know, for, for children in, in 14 days, it, even traveling in Japan. And it was fun and it was exciting, wonderful. But then, but then I was sitting next to the horn player and as children, you know, we were 12, 13. So we started to play with our feet with the music stands in the concert. And you know, it had to happen, of course. 
at some point in the middle of the concert or Mozart, whatever, Jack, it's so we, the only wind players, we started laughing. And as you know, when a violinist laughs in concert, it does not change the sound substantially or the pianist, they can smile or cry or whatever. It does not substantially change the sound. When we laugh, you squeak it, or you cannot, basically you cannot play anymore. So actually really for one minute, or maybe it was 20 seconds, but it felt like, like, like so long. We could not play anymore. And they were so mad with us backstage. They were really, anyway, there were many, many things. I remember some backstage things are, are funny or I played once my uh, elegy for clarinet solo with the Staatskapelle in Berlin in the Berlin uh, Philharmonie with Daniel Barenboim conducting and we were backstage and we were about so the people told us go on stage right so he said you know Jörg one moment in your elegy it reminds me so much on Alban Berg Wozzeck which moment is it so they were all like you know can you discuss later maybe you know go go on stage you know so we went on stage and my elegy is a very complex piece so it's 20 minutes uh, like a clarinet concerto very complex quarter tones runs many complex things so i had forgotten about it so so like three minutes before the end i was in my concentration it was packed uh, philharmonie in berlin and in the middle of it like a child baron boy was to me like here this moment it made me almost laugh so much i really had to turn away from him in order not to laugh because again as clarinetist you you see but he was so nice he forgot that i have a clarinet in my mouth in that book he just wanted to make sure that's the moment which reminds me of alban Berg. what do you think the future of music holds it's a disaster right now when we are talking i know how disastrous the situation is in spain i am aware of it my composition students are from Spain, um, but also now, two days ago, the German government decided the lockdown, France yesterday and so on. I think it's a disaster, if I may say this uh, with all the respect for the, the political decisions and they tell us everything is necessary, but they are so not logical. In Germany, they asked, and at many other places, they asked the cultural institutions, the opera houses, the concert halls, the orchestras, to, uh, to uh, get some uh, protection, new standards, you know, hygienic measures, uh, uh, you know, for people sitting far away from each other. They did all of that. Salzburg Festival happened with 75, more than 75,000 people coming to the festival in the summer no infections afterwards zero it's clear and the doctors say it the safest places right now are concert halls even the uh, in hamburg the senator for culture he said come to the elf philharmonie come to the theaters these are the safest places you can go to right now and they close everything down the first lockdown i understood it I did not understand it, but we did everything. We wear masks, we distance everything. Total understanding, it's a danger. I don't want to downplay it. But these decisions of this lockdown now, I don't understand it anymore. I think the politicians, they... Um, I don't want to be a politician myself right now. I, I don't say, I know uh, we can do it like that. But now, and you know it, when we met in, in Scotland, uh, when we worked together it's so illogical when i was in the planes i was uh, flying to heathrow first then from heathrow to glasgow it was half empty planes but the few people who were in the plane they were putting them in three rows next to each other next to each other if these the same people want to go to a concert hall or want to make a recording as we did they have to sit, sit very far away from each other. From this simple example, you see, it's not logical. And I think the people would accept much more if it would be logical. And I think it's a disaster for culture and we have to fight, maybe including myself. I say this, including myself, maybe we have to get louder and speak out with a louder voice and more clear voice. A life without culture is not the life which you want to what, what uh, want to have.
and we should be aware of that we only we don't only say this as musicians as artists do you want to live in a society without this no so i think it's a disaster and it was a wrong decision to close the concert halls down it, any other place is more dangerous than a concert hall with a security concept where people are sitting the mo safest place in berlin right now is the berlin philharmonie boulez Saal concert house i did many concerts there even in the last days and no infections in the audience and two days in two days they will say oh close it down um, it's a disaster and the, the arts are really endangered so therefore forgive me to be longer in this answer but it's very very necessary we as musicians maybe we have to find other forms of protest and of raising our voice because we cannot be silent anymore we were too polite we were too silent uh, towards our governments we all understand it's an extraordinary situation and you not every not every decision can be right but what they do with closing down the restaurants and the and the, the cultural places and opera houses i don't get it i'm here in munich my colleagues my friends from the opera orchestra they tell me the opera house it's 2400 seats right they played macbeth by verdi last night and already before the lockdown they play for 50 people audience. You know, you don't get an infection when there's 50 people audience, come on. But let us continue. Don't give us millions of money for not playing. Let us play. It's better for society and for the arts. Do you have any projects in the near future? In composition, there's a project which I haven't started yet, but uh, now I will uh, start a new composition which is always exciting you always feel insecure even if you have a have finished a big piece or opera or something i always feel like going back to zero and i will write a trumpet concerto for hakan hardenberger and andres nelsons conducting for the leipzig gewandhaus orchestra and boston symphony orchestra so that's uh, in my dreams it starts, or before I fall asleep, it starts, the first sounds emerge. So that's my next uh, composition. What do you appreciate in a performer? It has to do with exactly what we just talked about. Originality. When somebody is unique. Even if I don't fully agree with this Rita Dando, or who in the end cares? We talk about these details every day. And as you remember, when we worked together uh, in, the, in the orchestra, I'm a fetishistic about, about realizing a certain idea, which I have of, of, of something. But in the end, the most important thing is that somebody has to say something, to share something. And if this message is so strong and heartfelt, then stylistic questions become less important. You know, so that would be, for me, the musicians who, for example, take the old recordings by Wilhelm Furtwängler, for example. The use of, you know, freedom. I love, I love this. The stylistic way of playing Mozart is far away from how we consider Mozart to be played today. Does it matter so much when I hear his Gran Patita recording? It's stylistically, it's... It's very far away, even from what, what I would do or from... But it's one of my favorite recordings. I, maybe that's a good example, yeah. Do you have any advice for the clarinetistas del futuro? In general, I think for uh, young people and, and musicians in particular and clarinetists, it's very important, of course, to have, have a big range of influences. But please also, outside music, read, go to exhibitions, um, see the sculptures of Giacometti, I don't know. You will learn equally much for, for music, but also in music. Have as many influences in, as possible, but don't... Um, um, how can I say this? 
still try to find your own voice and decide in the end. And your teacher might tell you this when you have a masterclass with me or somebody. I might tell you this, a third person might tell you this. In the end, it's you who decides, well, this was not stupid what he said. This I accept for myself. The other thing right now, it does not help me so much. To make these decisions, it's a tough thing. But I want to encourage you to be yourself. That would be my main message.